get started. Thanks. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you uh, for joining AI in the co-requisite English classroom, navigating equity, implementation, and policy. We're thrilled to have you all with us today. My name is Julie Adams, and I serve as the site strategist for Strong Start to Finish. Strong Start to Finish is a national initiative that supports student success by scaling reforms in developmental education across higher education systems and institution intermediaries. This session is part of our developmental education reform learning community and is part of a special two-part series hosted in partnership with Every Learner Everywhere, a national network of organizations that advocates for equitable outcomes in U.S. higher education through advances in digital learning. Today's session will focus on the real-world application of AI in the co-requisite English classroom. This session is interactive and we encourage you to place questions and comments in the chat throughout the session. However, we do ask that you please remain muted until instructed otherwise. Uh, lastly, the session is being recorded. If for any reason you do not wish to be recorded, please feel free to remain with your video off or exit the session at any time. Uh, now I'm pleased to introduce our leads for today's session. Susan Adams, Associate Director of Teaching and Learning at Achieving the Dream. Eric Fierro, Project Manager at Achieving the Dream and Adjunct Faculty Member at Montgomery College. And Dr. Van Davis, Chief Drop Strategy Officer for WCET, the Witchy Cooperative for Educational Technologies. We're so glad to have you three leading us today. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and turn things over to our colleagues at Achieving the Dream. Hello, everybody. It's so great to see you. Thank you, Julie, for that warm introduction. Welcome, everyone, to our webinar on AI in the English Classroom. It's wonderful to have you join us. Susan, Eric, and Van are thrilled to speak with you today. They'll be sharing their insights on how, how AI can revolutionize the way we teach English. Let's dive into the future of education together. All right, so can you tell that was just a little AI video? I think it's uh, interesting to start off uh, these kind of just looking at what we can do nowadays. Uh, so just quickly go through our agenda. Just kind of want to quickly get through this so we can dive right into the, the material. We're going to start in a moment with a quick poll. You're going to need an electronic device of some kind to respond with. You can do it right here on your computer. You don't need anything extra, but you'll respond using your computer. Uh, and then we're going to move on to looking at how we can democratize education through our AI usage and this idea that there's like a promise to it. It's it's uh, we always like to put a question mark actually usually at the end of that we say the promise because it's you know it's kind of still an open question right. Uh, and then we want to move into the the kind of the ethical considerations that the discussion that this leads to as we think about AI its usage what it looks like in the classroom and its place in the classroom. Uh, we're going to talk about what it looks like in practice. We're gonna give you some examples of prompts, talk about prompt creation, how to craft prompts. And then we're gonna talk about how you might develop AI policy. And that is obviously a big discussion that involves many layers of your institution, but we wanna start that conversation. Uh, so we're looking forward to all of this today, uh, kind of going through it together with you. So the poll here, I'll shift it over to the instructions so you can see how to do this. You're gonna to go to either pollev.com and I'll put the link in the chat, forward slash efiero412. And you go to that and you'll fill out your response to the question, what are your biggest concerns about AI in the classroom? You can also respond via text if you wanted to, um, but you're gonna do pollev.com forward slash efiero412. There's a clickable link in the chat for you now if you want to. Uh, and then once we start getting some responses in here, I'll click over for us to see some responses come through and we can kind of respond in real time. Don't be shy. We know you all have thoughts and concerns. Here we go, I'm starting to come in now. Christy, you can feel free to put it in the chat if the tech isn't working there. If you're okay with not being anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
Yeah, I'm seeing a bunch of things that Susan and Van and I are looking forward to really highlighting today. So this is good. This is giving us a, an idea of the thoughts of folks in the room. Give a few more minutes or a few more, not a few more minutes, a few more moments here for folks to type in their responses. Apologies. Seeing that theme of plagiarism, cheating, and integrity, important one we're going to think about today. All right, so I'm seeing definitely some recurring themes, agreed, Susan. We're definitely seeing some recurring themes, and these are things that we have seen come up in other presentations that we've done on this very specific topic. So we're going to go ahead and move on, though. I appreciate your participation on this. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide here. So we... We're going to do some defining here. Um, we've all experienced AI in our everyday tools, um, such as autocorrect, voice assistance with Siri and Alexa, many apps we use, such as Google Maps, navigating traffic, or even setting up tasks by setting up reminders. That's all been AI for a long time. So what's different? Um, and I'm going to give a little historical context here, where back into 2017, there was a groundbreaking paper titled, Attention is All You Need. And this revolutionized AI's approach to language. It introduced a new method of creating AI systems, particularly adept at understanding human language. So this method involved processes known as transformers and attention mechanisms. And this resulted in the emergence of what, we're call, what they're calling large language models, which are ChatGPT, Gemini, and others. So these large language models represent a significant leap in AI's capabilities from what we've been used to, not just in language, but also in art and video, as you saw, um, and other creative tasks. So collectively, they're forming what we know as generative AI. So this new category of AI differs significantly from previous iterations because it focuses on creating new content. So LLMs work on the principle of prediction. So predicting what words come next in a sentence. So through an extensive training process involving billions of documents and significant computational power, these models have learned to understand language at a very deep level, and they uncover connections between words and use this knowledge to predict subsequent words in a sentence. So it's like an advanced version of autocomplete. Um, but the evolution of these models has been rapid and remarkable, as we're all experiencing. Um, initially, they could only write at a basic level, but now with the newer versions, their capabilities have skyrocketed. Um, so these models now perform exceptionally well um, in lots of different domains. So that kind of gives you the definition there. The, the tools that we're looking at, and there's many, and I love if anyone wants to put in the chat if they're already using tools, which ones are your favorites right now? Perplexity has been uh, an academic focus where they have a, a strong platform that shows citations. So a lot of academics are liking Perplexity. There's Gemini, there's ChatGPT, and I've been playing with Pi.ai, and that's a really interesting tool that's more of a therapy, actually supporting your emotional intelligence. Um, and they're finding that for mental health, that's actually, that's been helping, which can sound like a paradox so that we'll talk about a little bit later. So next up, I just wanted to highlight a couple of educator specific tools. So those tools that you saw on the previous slide are just kind of broad AI tools that are not targeted any specific demographic necessarily. These three tools, on the other hand, are specifically targeted in educators. Uh, they have items that will help you specifically in lesson planning, emails, uh, rubric structure. Uh, one of my favorite things, Magic School has a, and EduA both have free levels, permanently free levels. I love, for example, Magic School has an option to uh, adjust content for relevancy. You're able to take a content area that you're speaking on or a text, like let's say you're teaching on a particular reading portion and maybe your student group doesn't necessarily connect to that because they have a very different experience in life or they're at a different place, you can enter that text and give the context of the student demographics you're working with, and it will help you to adjust uh, an assignment to make it more relevant for that student's lived experiences uh, or what your student demographic might be. So these are some really cool educator-specific tools that uh, I myself use already regularly in my classroom and in my uh, course design to rethink and readjust things that I'm doing. 
So it's, it's crucial to underscore that generative AI serves as a tool. So this grants us the autonomy to shape its application in our daily lives and our educational environment. So as we navigate its implications today, it's essential to remember that the power to define its role rests with us. Um, so we're collectively striving for a critical equilibrium, maximizing its benefits while also actively addressing its challenges. And we're gonna get into those challenges and you've already named some of those. Uh, we're going to hear from Ethan Mollick in a moment, but I love this quote, which is, AI is not just a tool for automating routine tasks. It's really a catalyst for reimagining how we teach and learn. So we're going to give you some solutions, but we also really want to bring the expertise in the room here uh, to share with us how these solutions that we might, that we're giving to you will land. Um, and, and we welcome you to challenge us and some of our ideas about how we can navigate this. But let's hear from Ethan Mollick from the Wharton School of Business. Um, so among many things that I've been experimenting with AI, I've been requiring in the class. I want to tell you, talk to you a little about that. But I want us to have some ground rules about what I think AI is going to look like in classrooms in the near future. And so the answer is it's going to be undetectable, ubiquitous, and transformative. And all of these images, by the way, I did in mid-journey in three seconds, right? So um, the, the, if, uh, if they all have the right number of fingers now, that problem is solved. But uh, it's pretty amazing you can generate these kind of graphics instantly, right? But um, undetectable in that we know that you cannot detect AI plagiarism, right? Not, not just in the short term, it's possible. In the long term, uh, it's not possible. There's both theoretical reasons why it's not possible, but also I found that when I prompt my students to actually do a good job writing AI-based essays, they become undetectable. Just two or three rounds, and it's impossible for any of these systems to find out what they are. So you're not going to be able to detect AI plagiarism. And of course, who knows what plagiarism is anymore, right? Is working with the AI to come up with an outline that you don't use plagiarism? Asking it for 30 ideas for your essay and picking the one you like best plagiarism. Asking to rewrite a paragraph that you didn't like before. I've had students come up to me and say, English is my fourth language, and I don't do very well in English, um, and people don't take me seriously as a result, and now I just use AI to do all the writing and now I'm taken seriously. Is that bad? Is that plagiarism? We don't know. We have to grapple with some of these questions in a, in a serious way. Ubiquitous in that what makes AI so interesting is it's a tool available to over a billion people right now. And if you're rich, you have no better access than if you don't have a lot of money, right? The same tools available everywhere. You can use GPT-4, the latest model, free through Bing. Um, Hint, be in the purple creative mode. That's what you use GPT for. Uh, and you can actually use this system right now to do everything. It's in the hands of every teacher everywhere, right? So everything that you guys are doing in building ed tech, there's now a universal AI in everybody's hands. It is ubiquitous, not just among students, but among teachers. Not everyone's figured that out yet, but they will soon. And it's transformative in that we don't quite know what to do with this, right? I was on the stage yesterday and I was saying the original definition of the singularity, you may have heard of the AI singularity, right? The idea of a singularity is past that point, we can't predict what's gonna happen. And that's where we are right now. If you ask me, and I teach at a business school, what the future of jobs looks like two to three years out, I don't really know. I know that we're seeing 20 to 80% performance improvements at white collar tasks with AI, 20 to 80%. Steam power was 25%. I don't know what we do with that information, right? I don't know whether people do more work than they did before, whether the nature of jobs changes. I can't give you an answer to that, but we don't know what's gonna happen. A lot is going to happen in the near future. And it's transformative to education, too. I think that we have a real advantage here on the education side, for those of you who are educators, that I think we're gonna be fine. I think that uh, what we just saw from the amazing speech by Sal Khan is that there are tools that will make education better and more effective. We'll figure out, there'll still be a re need for classrooms. At least in the medium term, we're fine. We'll figure this stuff out. But is All right, I know he spoke very fast, so apologies there. Um, but I think he sets the stage for what um, we're predicting and seeing and starting to happen. Um, and I, you know, again, we don't have to agree with Ethan. I think he's being uh, in kind of giving us a provocation here for us to discuss and consider. Um, and we want to hone in on this idea of what constitutes plagiarism. Um, so, as you know, we are tasked with developing innovative approaches um, that not only address the issue, issue of plagiarism, but also foster an environment where authentic learning and critical thinking are paramount in the age of AI in the classroom. You know, so one such approach involves creating authentic assessments that engage students in real world problems and some scenarios. Um, also teaching students how to use it to assist their learning, not do it for them. Now we know this is a slippery slope. So let's look at this next slide where 
you know, this is coming out from Ditch the Textbook and our OER Pursuits, um, that kind of gives you a cognitive um, framework to think about the levels, right? So what is plagiarism in your classroom? Is it a student creating multiple AI responses and use the best parts to edit and submit? Would that be plagiarism in your context? Uh, students consulting AI for ideas. Is that plagiarism in your context? You get to decide these things. There's no shooting here. Um, these simply are questions and what we're going to have to grapple with as students uh, come to you. And we're going to show you a great video of one of our colleagues where this actually happened and a student came to them and said, this is how I used it. Is it cheating? And one thing that's been coming up for me as I've been thinking about productive struggle um, I've been reflecting on that concept in the age of, you know, thinking about pedagogies and how we learn. So it's the idea that certain challenges are essential for deep learning. So where does AI fall short in depriving students of this necessary struggle? And I'm realizing it's incumbent upon us to determine where the line lies in our assignments and to thoughtfully integrate AI into our classrooms. So deciding when and how AI tools are utilized will be crucial to preserving the integrity of that learning process and ensuring students engage in authentic, meaningful, and educational experiences. And that can happen at the course design level, but can also happen in how you speak about what this tool can do and how we inspire students to stay motivated and on track. So we just want and to cue this up. Oh. No, you got it. We just wanted to cue this up here. We had a great opportunity to meet with Nancy Murray from Community College of Baltimore County. Um, she had a student come to her. She'll, she's about to tell us about it, uh, that shared about using ChatGPT on an assignment. She had a discussion with her class. And then afterwards, we're going to share a, a video from one of her other students kind of thinking about and processing what AI looks like in the classroom. In my classroom, one of my students did an essay, turned it in, and then even before it was graded, approached me to say, hey, so I used artificial intelligence to write my essay. Was I cheating? And I, at the time, didn't even know what he meant by artificial intelligence. I was that green about the whole topic. I just didn't know. And I asked him and he told me, he explained to me how it worked and what he did and how much he had done. And then he just genuinely wanted to know did I cheat? He was, it was, he was really wanting to have that conversation. So I opened it up to the whole class and we talked about it. They also didn't know what it was. They were, they did come to the conclusion in just that kind of first discussion that he was cheating, <laughs> but they also thought he was amazing because he had this, you know, he was on top, on the, on the top of the, uh, the curve in terms of knowing what was going on and what was coming. And, and he certainly was. So the following semester, I knew, I just knew that this was going to be a thing. So I uh, started looking into it. And then once they had opened up ChatGPT to the general public as a testing, you know, bot to sort of get some feedback, I jumped on and started looking into it and, uh, and took off from there. So I want to... For me as a faculty member, I want to key in on one of the things that she said there, which is that the students didn't really know what was going on. I've surveyed my last two semesters worth of students. I teach a couple classes each semester. So this is uh, including winter session. This is five classes worth of gen ed level students. Uh, and of those five courses, averaging about 20 students each, I would say each semester, each course has seen about two to five students who actively have used or tried AI only. Our students are learning this right now also, just like all of us. This is something that I've seen at my college. Um, so it's a good conversation to start having, which is what Nancy started doing with her students. And this is from an interview she did from her English composition class, uh, asking her student about his experience with AI and an assignment that specifically asked them to look at it. What do you want to tell faculty and students about how to approach the whole conversation of AI with your students? I think that the conversation of AI really has to be approached with an open mind because whether you like it or not, it's here to stay most likely. It's not going to go anywhere and people are going to use it because it's new technology and it's helpful, which is the main thing 
that I think faculty should see that it's not doing all the work in general it's actually a helpful tool especially when it comes to letting students create a format for their ideas and letting them streamline it and allowing them to actually create their essays with their own thoughts and ideas but actually getting them started okay and for faculty to um you were you were saying that how should faculty approach this what what should we um what should faculty do in order to be able to approach it with an open mind i think they should have some hands-on experience with using it for an assignment um i know you used it for your uh class mm -hmm. to help you come up with ideas for it and that kind of helped you get acquainted with it and kind of see the trials and tribulations that some of the ideas were really bad <laughs> yeah exactly and that it's not just please write this essay for me and it poops out an essay. Right. Okay. <laughs> and it's, it's that easy. Right. Because okay. He goes on to kind of describe the assignment they did and his thoughts, but we want to be mindful of time and we want to allow for this to kind of lead into a discussion. So we'd love to know how many of you who are in the room have used AI in the classroom for an assignment. Um, we'd love you to place that in the chat or come off mic and let us know um, what that usage was and, and how it's impacted your class and your teaching practice. If there's any early adopters in the room, we'd love to hear um, what you've come up with. And if nobody's come up or nobody's using it in the classroom, um, if you're using it in any other aspects of your professional life, um, and then if that question doesn't land, we're happy also to hear what questions you might have in response to what you just heard from the students and from Nancy Murray. Study guides, Lisa, that's such a great, awesome opportunity. Um, we're seeing that more and more. Um, and Lisa, how did you guide students to actually have their own generative AI tool create a study guide? Be happy to hear that either in the chat or off mic. Rubrics, it's a great one. Outlines, job descriptions. There's my instructional designer, Christy. Love that usage. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Susan, I'd like to ask if Abby, if Abby Kincaid would share why you chose not to reuse that assignment. Because that's a very similar assignment to a colleague of mine. Uh, a colleague of mine uses generated exemplars from uh, AI programs for what you're describing. And he has found it to be really enjoyable and effective. So I'm curious why you chose not to reuse it. Um, I don't think students liked it very much. Um, I think mm -hmm. that some of them were uh, uh, intimidated because my, some of my students, there's very a lot of variability in terms of their uh, starting skill. So some could look at the AI generated essay and sort of do a more effective rhetorical analysis and see kind of where it was missing things or what was, what it was kind of um, where it was weak and others who were maybe not as strong a writers to begin with felt like it was better than anything they could create and therefore they felt intimidated by it and felt like their own um, voices were maybe not valuable because they couldn't compete with AI so I just didn't really like the outcome all that much mm -hmm. and moved on to something else this semester. I did it last semester. Yeah. Interesting. That's very, yeah, I mean, uh, so I taught music and that level of differentiation is something that I'm very familiar with, <laughs> that level of wide variety. And that's hard. Yeah, that's that's not something that I've heard come up. So thank you for sharing. That's really interesting, actually. Yeah. Sure. 
I love, you know, I'm really thinking deeply about that, Abby, because there is that notion of imposter syndrome, right? That's like naturally coming up is what I'm hearing you say, but also, you know, what is the process for developing our own voices? And when we see something, when we model someone else, um, and, you know, and how that really does affect uh, our process. And sometimes in some cases, not in a positive way. Uh, other cases, it can be uh, in a positive way. So appreciate your comment. Anybody else have ideas or plans that they want to uh, try utilizing it in their classrooms? I think Laura's assignment sounds pretty interesting. Because I teach asynchronous and synchronous courses myself, and I try to use that discussion board, and students despise the discussion board, at least in my, I don't know about all of you, but my student feedback surveys always have students expressing frustration with discussion boards. So I've been looking for ways to try new things. So I'm curious about Laura's assignment, if she could kind of give a little more context on that. Hi, this is Laura. Would you like me to speak? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, I started doing this because my students were using AI anyway. And so I figured I, I want them to use it. And I also learned that students have a lot of anxiety about AI. Um, and so I, based on what some other colleagues at my college are doing, they have these really long, complicated reflective assignments. And so I just built it into my lit discussions because I figured a lot of them struggle with the content. It's a good way to help them better comprehend the readings. Um, and their responses have been mixed. Some of them really hate the AI language models because they're so generic and they sound mechanical and they don't have that human element. Some of them don't like it because the responses that AI generates sometimes are incorrect. Um, but, but overall, I think it's given the students a profound boost in their confidence because they realize that at this point, at least, they can do better than AI. And they also comment that it helps them understand the texts better. And they, they have, have, I think they feel more confident about using it and seeing where its strengths and weaknesses are. That's awesome. I love that confidence with confidence boost piece. <laughs> yeah, this is so helpful. Keep them coming. Uh, the impact on students, you know, we we still are really hungry to hear um, what you're noticing and what you're seeing. Thank you, Laura. So one of the things that we want to get to is thinking about this idea of putting this into practice. All right. Um, and so at a high level, and, and Ethan Mollick speaks to this in some of his uh, blog posts and videos, is we have some levels of adjustment. Um, and what we're noticing is that we can expect more from students. Uh, for example, one faculty, and actually Ethan Mollick did this, re requires students to use AI for everything. And he placed it in his syllabus that students must understand that it lies to you a lot <laughs> and you're responsible for its content. Um, you know, so it's a tool and one you have to acknowledge. So um, what tools they use and they have to write a reflection on what worked and what didn't work at the very baseline is just kind of his high level requirement in his syllabus. But he noticed that before AI, he had students who had, <clears throat> had to come up with a product design and write an outline with AI in the class. But now with AI, they come up with a product design, build a working app, create a marketing materials and create custom graphics, right? So there's a lot more that he's now expecting from his students because there's this declarative knowledge that's so easily accessible from ChatGPT. It opens up the world for us as educators to think about having students go deeper, harnessing their curiosity, moving beyond memorization to application analysis and synthesis of knowledge. Um, and also that critical thinking piece, which I'm loving um, in Christie's, or sorry, Laura's example, uh, where students had to really analyze the outputs of the AI. Better pedagogy um, is about making the hard sort of pedagogies that we've really been amplifying in our professional development and have them go to scale. So we're gonna show you some prompts for having AI be an instructional design assistant to you, where you can take assignments and say, make this a project-based learning opportunity, make this more authentic for my uh, context of my students and my discipline, help me think about how to create those assignments, um, and also personalized learning. So imagining harnessing AI to create a learning environment that adapts to individual learning styles, where the students have the agency to do that, to create those study guides, 
Um, it isn't just about making learning more effective, it's about making it more inclusive. Uh, so you can really input who, the, um, who your students are and be able to personalize it. And then the last is adapting assessment methods, right? So developing new forms of assessment that get to those higher order thinking, creating authentic assessments, um, and also encouraging students to get feedback from AI. Um, that gets to be a little bit of a slippery slope. Um, it's getting better and better at being able to give those personalized feedback, but we want to direct students on what they're actually asking it to do. So this is, um, yeah, we want to kind of ground this in this co-requisite course, right? So if we're in this co-requisite space, you know, understanding the definition of co-requisite education is it's giving students a concurrent um, supportive uh, mechanism uh, inside or right next to the course that they're actually taking. So could AI provide that extra support for students? And that's where we're giving some of the solutions. Again, we're not, prom you know, we're, we're kind of asking the question, um, could AI help in those efforts? It seems like on the surface level, that really could work well. Uh, but of course, we need to understand how this actually works to be able to put this promise into play and make it actionable. So one way to do that is to think of AI as a tutor. Um, and here is uh, this idea of personalized prompts uh, for students using it. Um, so offering personalized exercises, readings and writing assignments. Um, that's where that study guide can come into play. Um, and but we get to teach students to do that, right? Some faculty I've actually seen have created their own personal chat GPTs, which you can do um, and create it and instruct it to be a tutor for your class and give them the link to use that personalized chat GPT. Um, but in other ways, you can just create its own prompt and direct your students to give that personalized learning path to their context. So here's how we do prompt, prompt creation. This is sort of the prompt engineering. It's really important to define your objective. You're gonna get a much better output when you start with a clear goal. So really answer to yourself, what do you need help with? Um, whether it's generating ideas, writing assistance, an example with, I need guidance on the steps to write an essay on renewable energy. Um, giving it the context, I'm a first year, second year student, or I'm teaching in this certain context of a community college, or I'm teaching a third year level course. Uh, so giving it that context is step two. That's really important in your uh, initial, uh, initial prompt generation. Um, and then specify your request. What's, be specific about what you're looking for. Um, what do you want? A list, a detailed explanation. Uh, do you want it to be a narrative? Um, that's going to be important in terms of identifying what output you want. And this is, again, relational, uh, which is really great. You can continue to refine these spe specificities as you go. Um, and then mentioning any preferences or constraints that you might have there. So here's a great example of a student prompt. I'm a first year student at a community college. I'm currently working on an English composition assignment where I'm asked to argue the importance of environmental conservation. I'm struggling to develop a compelling thesis statement and need help organizing my arguments. Without creating the statement for me, can you assist me in crafting a strong thesis statement and suggest an outline for my essay that includes key points to support my argument? Again, this is where we need to be directive um, and you know, play to the students that are gonna be motivated to use it as an assistant versus it being something that does the actual assignment for them. Next up is AI as course designer. So here we can do such prompts as you are an expert learning designer specializing in building curricula for classes that incorporate culturally responsive teaching or active learning, or I need help in making my course more of an active learning course. Um, and then, you know, give them those prompts. So, you know, for an economics class, students could predict, analyze and strategize financial solutions. For literature, students might use AI to analyze li linguistic patterns. It can give you outputs um, that you can choose from and you can say, hey, I want five more ideas or I want two more ideas. So you can use it in your own uh, role as long as you, again, give it that persona, give it uh, the context for which it's supporting your efforts. So I'm gonna hop in here. I do want to go back a little bit just because 
I want to point this out. I love ChatGPT. Most of the AI programs for image creation are very bad at text. And I just always laugh because this one, it was supposed to say syllabus in the upper left-hand corner. Lesson plan is on the right side. Text is pretty rough for ChatGPT right now. Um, but what I want to do right now is we're going to kind of actually look at an example of ChatGPT in practice and how you might choose to use it in uh, in your classroom and your planning. So this is a prompt, like a very basic prompt that I might use, for example. Uh, I would say to ChatGPT, and I'm going to switch my screen over to ChatGPT here in a moment, but want to give you a chance to see this and kind of go through it. I'm, I'm a college instructor teaching a course in music history. That's what I do. And I want you to give me three authentic assessment ideas based on my course outcomes. So then I would copy and paste my course outcomes in and ask it to give me just some general ideas. And you may, you can be much more specific than this, obviously. Uh, you're not super restricted. So for example, notice I'm in chat GPT 3.5. I wanted to make sure I demonstrated this in the free model, not one of the paid models because the outcome is different, right? Chat GPT 3.5 has not been updated since 2022, whereas 4.0 was updated in, I wanna say it was like September. So it's a very different level of uh, content knowledge. So there's my initial prompt of my question. And then I'm gonna put in my course outcomes. So I just pasted my course outcomes, and then I'm gonna hit go. So now it's kind of just pumping out some authentic assessment ideas tailored to uh, a college level course in music history. You can see there's, uh, it, this is another thing you'll see with ChatGPT and Gemini is similar. It likes to break things down by category. When you get outputs, it always likes to break them down by category. So it gives me critical analysis essays, listening and period identification quizzes. And it, it gives me all of these items. And then one of the things that I always appreciate is there is a certain level of explanation, of clarity given. And this is something that uh, I talk to my students about when they use AI uh, for study aids is that when they use it, it's important to pay attention to when it gives a justification or a reasoning, look at it and use that as an opportunity to assess the, the reasoning for why they chose that content. Also use that critical thinking skill to say, is this really, does this really, for me to, as a teacher, does this really align with what I'm trying to do? Does this not? Is it missing something? And it also makes me as an instructor question or reread my own course outcomes, my own items to make sure they're clear, to make sure that I'm putting things together in a way that makes sense. So this is one way that I might, uh, that I actually have used ChatGPT before. I see the question in the chat. Can you also ask it to provide output in a specific format? Um, I believe, yes. does 3.5 do the tables and stuff though? Mm, I've not tested that. That would be a good test, but it does do it in four. Yes, yeah. So there, I, I think there might be limits. Van, you were nodding your head. Do you remember, like, do you remember if 3.5 could do it in a table or not? Because I know there's differences in output levels. I believe 3.5 has table capacity. Let's see. I will also note as I type this in, there was recently a study published that showed that asking AI systems questions in polite language always gives better responses, specifically for English models, English large language models. They've shown that it's a much more accurate and better response uh, output if you ask it politely. If you're rude to the AI system, <laughs> it gives you worse outputs apparently. Uh, so just an interesting side note. So there you go, it pulls it out in a table also. And I appreciate this because as it broke it down, you can see there's the criteria, description, and idea. You can do this with lots of different parts. Um, I use this for discussion questions, things like that. It, it's a quick, it's a quick uh, kind of just like pick me up for my brain, especially if you've taught the same class for a long time. I've taught the same class now for seven years, the same modalities, the same all those things, and it gets repetitive. It does get repetitive. All right. So next up, we do want to have a little opportunity for you all to practice and try this out. So what we'd like you to do is open up your favorite Gen AI tool. Could be ChatGPT, could be Gemini, could be Claude. I just learned about Claude yesterday. I'd never used Claude before. Um, it could be one of the other educator specific tools. We want you to open it up and we want you to ask yourself this question of what do you need help with? What would help you? Is it creating a rubric? Is it creating a set of outcomes? Is it 
coming up with live discussion questions that will look at depth of knowledge, for, for example, or look at a certain level of Bloom's taxonomy. And then so just put that into the prompt. Tell it who you are. I'm a college faculty member teaching uh, English co-requisite and what you need help with. And then just be specific. Great question. While, while folks are working, Natalie asked, which tools do you like best or does it depend on the task you're doing? ChatGPT is generally broadly my go-to tool just because it's kind of a Swiss army knife. It has all of the GPTs. If you pay for the subscription, it has a lot of GPTs that include video creation, PowerPoint creation. Um, you can upload Excel documents for data analysis. You can upload PowerPoint documents. One of the things that I have done is I've uploaded my lecture PowerPoints and asked it to create discussion questions from my, lec my PowerPoint lectures. And it creates those things for me to help kind of get things moving. Um, but then for other things like, for example, the relevancy point or depth of knowledge or rubric assessment or things like that, I might use an educator specific program. Like uh, like Magic School or or Educate or Educate or something like that. And then I know there's Quillbot, right? And there's other things for writing specific elements. I, I've heard of some other ones. We will talk about that, Elaine. Yep, that is something we have coming up in a bit. All right. So now what we wonder is, as you're doing this, as you all are working in your Chat GPTs, not Chat GPT, sorry, as your Gen AIs, I feel like Chat GPT is going to become the Kleenex of this tool, of these tools. You're, you're just gonna refer to everything as Kleenexes. Um, I'm curious, what, what are your responses when you're seeing what the output is? Are you feeling like this is, what you're seeing is helpful? Are you needing more support? What are your kind of like feelings as you're getting these responses back? I'm just curious what folks are seeing and how you're feeling and reacting. Is anybody putting it, it in for the first time and curious what your output is in this very moment? Yes, Leigh, yes. More refining questions. Yeah. Absolutely. That is, uh, I have long conversations with my AI tools, refining and going back and forth and editing my prompts. Absolutely. And Laura, you're right. It get, you know gives it the summary saying, here's why my output is useful. <laughs> It's uh and, and that gets to be a learning moment. So I had a request to show you the back end of Chat GPT in case you wanted to see all the GPTs, because maybe some folks have never paid or seen what's on the ah. back end of it. Um so I'm gonna go ahead and switch my screen back over while you're all working on that so we can take a look at that quickly. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this. I don't wanna take over. So when you pay for Chat GPT, it comes with all these GPTs, and it's a little overwhelming at first. These are the, if you scroll down, this is not all of them, but there are a variety of them broken down by category. Dolly is like image creation, stuff like that. Uh, writing, these are the top writing tools, but there's thousands of these GPTs. So if you type in anything at all, it gives you a longer list of tools that are available for you. Uh, I and know- this what Eric's showing you is this is crowdsourcing, right? So open AIs, you know, their commitment to the world is to make this as open and free as possible. So these are just people essentially in their garages, shall we say, um, who've decided to make a personalized chat GPT and give it a specific set of instructions for it to do very specific tasks. And then they published it to the world through open AIs platform. So that's what this is. And you can see big companies are doing it. Khan Academy, Learning Academy is in there with a tutor program. Uh, if you need help with vacation planning, Kayak is down here, helps you plan a vacation, stuff like that. So those are just some of the different things that you can see here. Um, yeah, so I don't want to take up too much time. So we're going to go ahead and move forward. Uh, I feel free to keep working and trying it in the back end. We have lots of prompts. I'm happy to share more things that I've done. Some of my favorite ones that I haven't even talked about because we don't have all the time in the world. Um, but the next thing I wanted to talk about because you're all in, you're, you're English faculty. One of the big concerns we see, especially from English faculty, is this idea of citation. And this is an evolving element of AI usage uh, because 
at first, the citation templates and, and standards, we're not sure how to react to it because it's a tool. There's no specific author. It's a generally sourced created item that doesn't have a specific author and it cannot be duplicated. And the purpose of citations is to allow folks to go back to it and verify the information. So how am I supposed to cite this? Now, what has happened is Chicago, APLA, APA, and MLA have all provided guidances on how they recommend citing AI services. This took some time and they are still constantly changing. Uh, in the time between February, when I first started kind of like looking into citation deeply, uh, and, to, and two days ago when I was working on these slides, APA actually changed their recommendations and also created a new set of guidelines specifically for scholarly publications. And so there are constantly evolving elements to this citation conversation. For MLA specific, this is some of the guidelines that they give and how they recommend it. I'm using MLA as an example because I don't want to get too deep on all three of them. And I know that uh, MLA is the more standard English one, at least as far as I remember from grad school. Uh, so they do not recommend treating AI as an author. This differs from uh, Chicago. Chicago method does actually treat AI as an author. So that's a difference. There are differences between the different models. Uh, you would do this by putting the title of the source. That would be what is generated. It could be your prompt. It could be just kind of like the, the title at the top of the chat GPT thread, whatever it might be. The title of the container and the version. So for example, you could put chat GPT 4.0. Uh, some people also put the date. So I think currently chat GPT 4.0 is version September, 2023, because that's when it was last updated. And then you would put the publisher. So the publisher in this case for ChatGPT would be OpenAI. For Claude, it would be whatever the, the AI system is. Um, and then you put the date generated and the URL. So this is what it might look like. Describe the symbolism of the green light in the book, The Great Gatsby by F. Scott, F. Scott Fitzgerald. That was the title. And then ChatGPT, 13th the February version, OpenAI, the access date, and then the URL. So this is kind of like a very broad example. They also use in-text citations as an opportunity. So you might just say, this was generated via ChatGPT. Uh, these are gonna be college to college, classroom to classroom about how you're gonna determine this. Um, yes, absolutely. The different journals, I have started to see that. Different journals, uh, like my wife publishes in medical journals, they have started talking about creating standards uh, on how they would approach AI generated or reviewed information. Um, so absolutely, journals are starting to define these elements also. All right, so that was really quick, but go for it, Susan. Okay, so now we're gonna bring up um, Nancy again, who's gonna speak to a little bit more about equity, but she also uses the word ethics. Uh, to help us begin to think about what we need to be, what are the guardrails here uh, for this usage? Um, and she starts off with a, a good um, example here. Um, but I had students, many students, I had neurodivergent students, I had students from all over the world in my classroom doing this, and um, I heard that you know, the it's difficult to learn through the the veil of uh, language, you know, to sort out the language before you can get into the learning. Um, so speakers of, of other languages um, use chat. They used it to try to decipher how to, what the words are mean, what the instructions mean and sort of translate it for them. And then they know, and then they dig in and then they could do it. So um, the neuro, well, I had a student who was pretty deep on the spectrum of autism, and she was very clear about the fact that she um, uses AI to help her because one of her issues was she has no filter. So she would say things very bluntly that would upset everybody else in the class, but she wasn't meaning to. It was just the, the way that she processed information and then repeat and, and spoke. So she used chat to say, how can I say this in a more socially acceptable way? And chat would give her a nicer way to say it. And she would respond like that. It worked beautifully. Um, I have a, I had a student from Iran who was telling me that he, he and his, his whole study group come together and they use it to sort of 
figure out, you know, how to, again, the language barrier, the differences, and um, not to cheat, none of them to cheat. You know, I think faculty is often afraid that they're going to cheat, you know, but there's always somebody who's going to cheat, right? We can't play to them. We have to play to the students who are there to learn, which I think are certainly the majority of students. So in terms of ethics, there's a couple different ideas, right? You know, there's the ethics of balancing the playing field for students who are neurodivergent or don't speak English as a primary language and are in the same classroom as people who do. So that, that there's an ethics to that as well. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan. We do need to be careful with it. We do need to learn about it before we learn to start using it. And I think it's important for our students to learn what it is and how it works before they use it. That's our job. Um, so we've talked a little bit about how you use this, um, but we need to contextualize that. And before I, I give you an example of an ethical framework that um, the federal government has created with the White House AI Bill of Rights, I want to contextualize why it's important for us to think about ethics. Uh, there is an extraordinary scholar, Ruha Benjamin, who's written a book called Race After Technology. And in it, um, Dr. Benjamin talks about the emergence of what she calls the new Jim Code. Now, if you're a historian or you remember your college history, you'll remember the Jim Crow laws were segregationist laws that were passed after the end of the Civil War, um, end of 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And those Jim Crow laws, those segregation laws, lasted until the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And what Dr. Benjamin is, is saying when she talks about the new Jim Code is that oftentimes we mistakenly think that technology is neutral and objective. And the reality is that technologies, whether what, whatever the technology may be, and these tools, specifically these generative AI tools, are not neutral and they are not objective. Um, at their heart is this idea of algorithmic bias that Susan's going to talk a little bit more about here in a moment. But what Dr. Benjamin suggests with this idea, the new Jim Code and, and in her work, Race After Technology, is that we need to think about the ethics. We need to contextualize our use of these tools um, within an ethical framework. And we need to do that individually, but we probably need to do that um, on a larger scale, whether that be your department, whether that be your institution, or whether that be uh, socially uh, as a society. And so there are a number of different ethical frameworks out there. The one that I like to talk about is the White House's AI Bill of Rights. And there's five components to it that I think um, translate very well to what we do as educators. There's this this idea that AI systems should be safe and effective. Um, they need to do what they say they're going to do, and they need to cause no harm. Just like medicine, just like a doctor takes that Hippocratic oath of cause no harm, our AI systems should cause no harm. Um, our AI systems need to address algorithmic discriminat discriminatory algorithmic practices. Um, we need to make sure that those practices um, are fair and are equitable, and that they're not discriminating. Um, they aren't designed to discriminate against certain individuals or groups of, of individuals. We need to make sure that there's data privacy and data transparency. Um, this material, whatever you put into these models, is most of the time becoming a part of their training set. And so we need to make sure that, the that we have sovereignty over our own data uh, and that we know how it's going to be used. Um, and I would suggest that that stands to reason for students as well. Whatever student data we put into it becomes a part of the training set. We need to make sure that we have sovereignty over our data just as much as our students have sovereignty over their own data. We need to think about notice and explanation. People have a right to know when an AI system is being used um, that's going to impact them. Um, our students have a right to know whenever we're using an AI system that may impact them, just like we have a right to know. And we have a right to know that in language that is understandable. 
um, that it should be explained to us in language that we can understand. And that there should be human alternatives and, feed, and, and fallbacks. This idea that um, if an AI system is going to make an important decision that impacts us, we should have the right to appeal that decision to a human, um, that the system should never have the final say. So when we think about Dr. Benjamin's idea of, of AI systems being this new gem code, we have to situate this work within this ethical construct. And we want to, I think for our purposes today, specifically hone in on one of those components, and that's algorithmic discriminatory practices that Susan's going to talk a little bit more about. So algorithmic bias is, is a pressing challenge at this intersection of technology and, and education. And like Van said, it's demanding our attention uh, to really think about this deeply. So it's essential to recognize that these AI systems can carry biases. So do we as humans, we all have bias. So it results in this kind of systematic errors that can potentially produce unfair outcomes. And these biases can reflect societal inequalities and it manifests ways that can unfairly advantage or disadvantage some students over others. So for instance, grading algorithms might inadvertently favor essays, essays based on certain language patterns or learning platforms, may not adapt equally to all students' strengths. Um, and that can reflect deeper issues within the data these systems learn from. Um, so for instance, AI that recommends learning paths based on past student performance could steer students from lower income backgrounds away from advanced courses based on biased assumptions about their abilities. So what do we do about that, right? It's important that we simply understand it, um, that we know that this is true, uh, which doesn't mean we need to demonize it, but we need to understand that we have to be transparent with our students. So by engaging in hands-on demonstrations, students and faculty can observe biases firsthand and discuss their impacts. And we don't have to hide this from them, we get to talk about it. So analyzing data that, uh, uh, that <clears throat> feed all these AI systems is crucial, which is not always what we can do, but we can understand uh, at least having this Bill of Rights uh, ask these companies to be more transparent about those data sets and models can help us. And that ends up prompting questions about representation and potential oversight. So the conversation around the ethical implications of AI in education is vital, and it encourages critical thinking about technology's role and how it can serve everyone fairly. Um, and projects and discussions in this vein can foster a collaborative environment where students and faculty work together towards more equitable solutions. So that's what we're encouraging you to do. So once we have this uh, ethical framework in place, at WCET last year, we developed an AI policy and practice framework. And you'll notice that we have three categories here. We have governance policies, we have operations policies, and we have pedagogy policies. Um, but you'll see at the top there that ethical and responsible use of AI cuts across all of those categories of, of policy development. Because what we do is we feel like that we have to work from that ethical framework. And that's a framework that you begin to create um, individually. It's a framework that you also can begin to create collectively, both as your department and even as your institution. And I know that this table here can be a little overwhelming. So I wanna pull out a few categories of policies that are particularly important in the classroom, but also particularly important for an institution to grapple with and try to come to some collective agreement. Um, one of those is inclusive, equitable access. Um, as Eric has pointed out, there are paywalls associated with some of these tools. So we need to be talking and thinking about how do we make sure that all of our students, regardless of their ability to pay, have access to the tools that are going to be the most effective and the tools that they're going to need to know how to leverage, not just in their learning career, but in their career after college. Um, we've already had somebody mention intellectual property. I want to talk just really briefly to that. One of the things that happens with most of these large language models is that whatever information you put into it uh, becomes part of the training set. And so that means that you need to be very aware. 
You need to be aware of your own intellectual property that you're putting in and recognizing that when you put it into that system, it is out in the wild now and that system is going to continue to use it and iterate on it. You need to be aware of the intellectual property of your students or what you're asking your students to put into the system as well. Uh, and then there's a couple of other areas that we think are particularly important. Um, academic integrity, which we've already talked about, being able to not only determine what your academic integrity policy is going to be, but making sure that you're articulating that to your students so that your students understand it. We've talked a little bit about assessment practices and the importance of beginning to create authentic assessments that talk about and assess students on their ability to use materials, their skills and their abilities, rather than merely assessing them on their um, capacity for presenting knowledge. Um, these tools begin to make that knowledge pr presentation obsolete. Um, although students still need to understand the material enough to know whenever a, a tool is hallucinating. But being able to think about what assessments look like now in the age of AI. And then the last one that I want to highlight really quickly is learner accessibility. And this is something that Nancy talked a little bit about. These tools have a tremendous ability to level the playing field for students that have specific learning needs. They also, though, have the ability to create more discrimination for some of those students. There's been a study, and there's only been one study, unfortunately, that's been done looking at the um, ability of large language models uh, such as Jet, Chat GPT and Gemini and how accessible they are with screen readers. And that study found that they're not very, they don't play nicely with screen readers necessarily. And so one of the things that we urge institutions to do is to look at your existing learner accessibility policies and make sure that any use of these tools in the classroom is going to be accessible to those learners and it's going to be in accordance with those learner accessibility policies. So what we'd like to do is give you an opportunity to think about and talk to each other about the areas in which which policy areas might be the most important for you to consider as you begin to incorporate these tools into your classroom or perhaps you've already incorporated these tools into your classroom? So is it learner accessibility? Is it academic integrity? Is it intellectual property? Maybe it's equitable access. Maybe it's research. How are you going to use these tools for research and teach your students to use these tools for research? What are the policy areas that are going to be the most important for you to consider as you begin to incorporate these tools into the classroom? So via the magic of Zoom, we're going to put you into uh, some opportunities to talk to each other about this. You'll have about 10 minutes, and then we're going to come back and share as a group what areas of, of policy have sort of risen to the top as the ones that you think that you need to be dealing with sooner rather than later. So Eric, I think you're going to be our master of the magic of Zoom. I'm wondering. So the native all the that you have around, but those dreams have remained and they turn around. We do not believe you. Audio is distant, Eric. It's hard to hear. Oh, thank you, Linda. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> nice, Eric. All right, welcome back, everybody. So we're glad that y'all had a little bit of an opportunity to talk with each other about what are the areas, the policy areas that you think are going to be the most important for you 
as you either continue to incorporate AI into your classroom or you consider incorporating it. And I'm, I'm curious if anyone wants to share what sort of rose to the top of your concerns, especially thinking about where you started with the concerns that you articulated at the beginning of the session today. So Laura's talking about AI can silence student voices. Yep. Uh, equity and accessibility. Academic integrity continues to be an issue. So academic integrity I see in the chat is coming up pretty frequently. Does anybody want to say, come on camera or come uh, on mic uh, and say something about how you see academic integrity playing out in your classroom and what you might want to do to address that? I think um, one way to address it is having students do drafts in class or start a writing in class, which is also good teaching, you know, to, that, that writing is a process and that it's something that where revision is important. So to be able to keep their record of that. Yeah. And I see too, I, I, I want to, um, something that Eric put in the chat too is, that we sometimes hear too that students say that AI doesn't represent their voice. And so needing to think about that and that's drafts is one of the ways to sort of help students work through that. Uh, I, I see too, uh, Linda pointed out, um, and this is something that we hear a lot at WCET and spend a lot of time talking to our members about is limited resources for faculty, particularly adjunct faculty development. Um, so that, that need for professional development and the need for development, not just for faculty, but a need for professional development for students as well and for staff so that everyone understands um, the uses of these tools and understands the dangers that are associated with them because these aren't, these can be dangerous tools. They discriminate, they, cut out intellectual development at times. They can be used as crutches at times. And so, and there's, we've talked about privacy and intellectual property concerns with them. Other things that folks want to uh, elevate before we move on. Susan, why don't we move on to you next? Great. Um, I will give an example, Linda. Is it okay if I give the example that you you brought forward? Sure. Why don't you speak to it? I really love the the app idea. The what idea? Oh, the the um the helping with the dissertation. Oh, well, um, I'm. I've completed just my dissertation, but I didn't use these tools because I just learned about them. Um, but there's two uh, women in, in higher ed and they've created a tool um, where they have, they're using ChatGPT and Claude as the underpinning of their of the tools that are patented, if you will, their, their software. But it's just, they they were very ethical in the sense that they did not want the tools to be writing dissertations or chapters of your dissertation for the, the students. So they purposely created prompts based on their knowledge and also feedback that they got from doctoral students that actually are already helping students with each chapter. Like let's say the literature review, um, you know, the, the research design, which is chapter three, and so in a sense, I view that as a way to an equity perspective, because it helps students that may not be in the position to hire a writing coach um, that helps with this, with dissertation, 
um, be able to have a writing coach at a very nominal fee. And actually their business plan is really to approach universities and have that be part of a resource they would provide their doctoral students. And I, I really love that. And having become more familiar myself, because I was, I was not a chat GPT person until about maybe three months ago, I can say that it, it, is, it will be a game changer. And I see that for underserved populations in particular with limited resources. Because you can go to the writing centers of universities, but adult learners may not ne necessarily be able to get on their schedule that coincides with their schedule. And let's say a lot of times students are writing very late at night. Well, there's no writing center consultant on staff that's going to be there for you at 10 or 11 at night. You know, usually it's eight, nine, and that's it, you know, if you're lucky. So that was my example. Thanks so much, Linda. And Linda's speaking to something that we're also, um, this is a little bit predictive, um, but we're talking, a lot of folks are talking about enterprise. So this idea that, People are going to create customized apps, but also think about it as an enterprise instance of generative AI on your college campuses. The campuses are going to start designing a full um, AI integrated um, institutional campus that's personalized, relevant, and meaningful to that campus. Uh, that's going to allow for student supports as well as faculty development and student learning to all be supported with AI tools that are built by the university itself. I think we're going to see that in the not too distant future. And Linda's example is a great one of a product, right, that's going to help uh, do uh, get to those uh, learning goals um, at that uh, dissertation level. So we wanna open it up to general questions. We can certainly continue with uh, what Van has brought to the table around the policy and the challenges, um, but we wanna really open it up. This is an opportunity to talk with your peers uh, and really bring forward to all of us a challenge that you might be facing that we could give you solutions for or examples that have worked in our context um, or other specific questions. Uh, this is all for you. Uh, and we don't want you to miss this opportunity to connect uh, as a group like this with questions that are relevant and meaningful to you. So please let us know. So while you all are thinking, I just wanted to bring up when we were talking about the equity stuff, a piece that we didn't maybe mention in this might catalyze some conversation here is around the equity portion is the idea of AI detection tools uh, within writing courses. And, you know, there, there absolutely can be a use for those, don't get me wrong, but there is an issue with the equitable accuracy or how those tools look at and analyze things. So for example, uh, there has been research that has shown that English language learners are at a higher risk of detection uh, for being plagiarized, plagiarism tech, you know, like being labeled as, as AI created items than non-English language learners, than native speakers. So there's an issue with regard to how those AI detection tools are being used and, and accurately represented. There's a reason why a number of universities have stopped using that. My own college is one, for example, uh, that turned off that part of Turnitin. We use Turnitin and they turned that portion off because it was showing so many issues. We had a couple of uh, faculty members who showed examples of their own writing being flagged as AI written and things like that. So they turned that off. So I know that with those types of things, it's important to remember that AI detection tools can be problematic. Now it can be a teaching tool. I'll give an example. There's a a professor at our school who uses it as a teaching tool for writing specifically. Um, he when not a teaching tool necessarily, but an improvement tool, I guess we could call it. When students uh, submissions do score a certain level on an AI detection tool, he talks to them through the report, like he gives them the AI report. And they talk about maybe what about their writing might have been flagged as AI and they have this opportunity to talk through those things and then revise and, and it becomes a rewriting tool also. So I just wanted to bring that up. Maybe that'll catalyze some conversation. Maybe it won't. I don't know. Thoughts? Victoria had a question. So
Susan, do you want to speak to that, the algorithmic bias stuff? Okay. Uh, can you say more about algorithmic bias? Um, how we use AI in the classroom? You mentioned grading tools. Anything? Uh, any other examples you can share? Victoria, do you mind clarifying that a little bit? I know we defined algorithmic bias, but it sounds like you're noodling on a specific aspect of its impact or tell me more. So I think I, I'm just kind of processing what was shared and the fact that um, these learning models take information that, you know, from data sets that are, that don't mm. include diversity. So there's something about the information that is generated that may like, how do we address that in the classroom? Great. Well, I'm going to give you an example. We put a bunch of Dolly images inside of the deck. And you'll notice that in some of those images, white people were centered and privileged in those images, right? Sort of the traditional, you know, collared shirt uh, in a faculty study room, right? That's a that's a potential bias, right? So Victoria, the, the, the solution is to simply talk about it, right? Like we are going to see bias in all the outputs from all of these LLMs. And we simply need to teach students to be critical thinkers and to unpack that. Now I did go back and say, please change the gender of these images. And it came up with a different output, right? So I kind of refined it there, um, but it is reflecting what they see in the internet, right? So. These, uh, what our data sets are on the internet, we know naturally has bias and privileges um, white centered um, aspects of our society and our world. And we get to teach that at all levels and we have been for many, many years. So that's my solution um, is transparency and um, engaging students in much more critical thought. Uh, Cause it's not, we could try to change it. And there's some aspects that we're asking as you can see in the White House policies for these companies to do that. But when that's going to happen and how robust that's going to be um, is certainly in question. Yeah, yeah Laura, I love that that's that your husband is is um, going up against that, which means, you know, he's got job security. Right? <laughs> he gets to create uh, an image that's going to have much more representation there um, as one solution in that in that aspect. Other questions or comments? I know we've talked about challenges. I also wonder, is anybody really excited about AI um, or feeling inspired um, for how they're going to use it in the classroom? And Paula's got a great question in the chat as well. What would you like to learn more about in the future that we can help you with? Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Linda. So Susan, maybe we want to share Nancy's final thoughts video now, or do you want to? I think that would be a great idea. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Not a problem. We've got one more video for you all from our friend Nancy from Community College of Baltimore County. Uh, at the end of our chat with her, she just had some great final thoughts, and we just want to share those final thoughts with you as we wrap up. I was thinking that a lot of us faculty are older than a lot of our students. And like personally, I can remember when computers came onto the scene and um, it was scary, right? I'm sure it was scary back further in the day when calculators came onto the scene. Um, it's scary when change comes in such a big way. And I think the exponential change that's going to be coming is, is, is um, something we all need to buckle up for. 
our students though, technology is not change for them. Many of our students are born into technology, so they don't feel like there's an ethical issue with using it. They see it as a tool, like Tamar said, it's a tool um, and they use it as a tool, but they're still trying to learn and they're still trying to grow. And, you know, we're, we can still be shepherds in that, but not if we're resisting the inevitable and not if we're, um, you know, looking at it like they're, they're going to use the power for good, for not for good, you know, but they're going to use it and we, we have to learn how to use it um, in a way that will lead us all to more, you know, more curiosity, more enthusiasm. You know, I, I often say if, if I had a sous chef, I would never chop another vegetable. I'm, I love to cook. Right. And, and, but the creative part of cooking isn't about, you know, chopping vegetables. The creative part of cooking is to thinking of the ideas. So we can let go of some of the grammar rule, you know, problem. We can let go of some of the things that are bogging us down trying to learn these things um when we have these tools we can just go right to the innovative thinking and the you know the imagining and the and the uh the, the beauty of the possibilities here and in math and sciences too um students are using it as well to to pull up questions and and have chat break it all down and show it all to them and yes there's an answer but if you think back on the days when there were books the bo answers were in the back of the book we always looked in the back of the book that's kind of how we checked if our work was going if we were getting it and um so i've had one of my students went in deep about that about how he uses it for math all the time but he wants to see how chat got the answer and chat gives every single step of the way in ways that teachers can't always do in the classroom because they're over here talking to this person when this person is struggling over there and if they can get chat to break it down for them then so much more learning can happen in the classroom um, than we're doing right now so there, don't be scared of it I mean be smart about it and make sure you learn about it and make sure you teach them about it and uh, have a lot of fact checking going on and stuff like that, but it's here. I was thinking that. I'll... So we just want to wrap up with you know a thank you. Um, there's a survey in the chat from Julie, and uh, on April 18th, Susan and I are going to be leading a much deeper dive on AI through a uh, ATD to four hour workshop where we're going to get much more uh, deep and have a much like get our hands dirty more throughout that that day on the tools themselves. Uh, there's a URL at the bottom there, tinyurl.com forward slash ATD AI event if you want to go and and, and uh, look into it. But thank you all so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you hopefully at our next session on April 25th. Thanks all.